That, for me, was probably the most intense experience I had reporting in, in America. I think everyone who worked there and reported on it was affected by it. It was something else. It, it really, you know, young kids, it just hit home for me personally and colleagues with children really, really uh, struck them. The first reports coming in were of a, a couple of children had been shot and a, a, a school teacher had been injured. You have everyone in the classroom and the door. All of my students, the door is not locked yet. I have to go. There's reports of a gunman, reports of children going to hospital, um, and obviously that that sort of sense of dread because it was an elementary school. There have been shootings in schools in America, but not in elementary schools or primary schools. And I think that's, that's what made us realize very early on this was going to be a very different mass shooting. That a gunman on the loose in a primary school was going to be an even worse kind of incident than we'd been used to in America before. I got uh, bodies here. I went home and packed a bag and raced back in, and, and in the 20 minutes I was gone, it had gone from a couple of children shot and a school teacher injured to, at that point, it was almost 20. I think they had almost come to the 20 shot dead. It was a look on my producer's face at the time when I came back of, you know, the sheer horror. Be advised, we should have multiple weapons, including long rifles and shotguns. We flew up there as soon as we could, and we were up there late evening. And to give you an idea, in those just a few hours, every network news crew in the area had got there. All the big networks were there. And there was this sort of forest of lights and cameras outside this building, where just a few hours earlier, parents had been gathered, and they'd been told, some of them, that their kids weren't coming home. It's obviously a horrific event, but you've got to try and show what's happening, but you've also got to be respectful of what's, what's occurred. By the time we got there, Gordon was back a bit. It was difficult to talk to people up close initially anyway. People were already laying flowers. Some people would put out makeshift signs. There was grief and, and people responding to the grief all around us. People over and over again would say, this doesn't happen here, this is such a small town, this sort of thing just doesn't happen. I guess it's like, you know, if, if it happened in my hometown, I, I would probably feel the same. It's clearly, it's a, it's a horrific event. Another friend of mine said that um, there was a man, a masked man came in and just started shooting. Americans have a real, more than anywhere else I've been in the world, they have a real duty. They feel a sense of duty that they should talk to the cameras whenever they can. So in the few hours after the shooting, you had children in the car park of this school being interviewed by TV crews. I was in the gym and I heard a loud, well, I heard like seven loud booms. You know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds talking about what they'd been through. Every door in the building, except for the ones in the hallway, had to close. And they were saying the same things as you've seen teenagers and adult Americans say after shootings, but these were, these were young kids. I saw some of the bullets going past the hall that I was right next to. Then a teacher pulled me into her class. My daughter, Emily, would be one of the first ones to be standing and giving her love and support to all those victims. 
because that's the type of person that she is. There was one dad, he spoke literally the day after it happened, I think, and he, he wanted to say, he wanted to tell the world how amazing his daughter was and, um, and how lucky he was to have had her. Not because of any parenting that my wife and I could have done, but because those are the gifts that were given to her by her Heavenly Father. I'm being struck, you know, how incredibly brave that was. And I think it's part of this American tradition of well, this feeling that you, you, you have to bear witness to what's happened. Um, you have to say what's happened and so it has an effect on the future, but also because you want people to know what your daughter is like. In the middle of the town centre, there was a Christmas tree, because this was just a few weeks before Christmas. And this Christmas tree became a shrine. People came from miles around, sort of as a pilgrimage, to, I guess, express their solidarity and grief with what had happened in the town. And so we interviewed these people as they came. It's time for change. This is, I'm left speechless. It's shocking. It's appalling. This one lady had driven up from New York. What made you come up here? Um, I don't know. I guess I didn't really know what to expect or what I was going to see. More so just to, just to, um, I guess, see if there was anything that could be done. But um, all you can do is talk to people and pass out hugs. And Dominic, I remember asking her, you know, why are you so sad? She couldn't explain why she came, but she felt she needed to. And, uh, you know, I teared up and, and it's difficult to listen to what these people were saying. It, you know, she had no connection with anyone. But she just felt she had to be there. It's just overwhelmingly sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't put your child on a school bus in the morning and never see them again, or drop them off at school and never see them again. I remember the day after we arrived, there was a librarian giving a press conference in one of the car parks near the, the school. She also felt that she had to come out and say what had happened to her. We started hearing the gunshots, so I yelled lockdown to the group that was in our room, and I ran across the hall and told the classroom across from us to lock down. I remember thinking, this is a country where children aged five, six, and seven are, all of them, they're all routinely drilled to go through a lockdown procedure because of the possibility of a gunman coming to their school and shooting them. And this is a country where that's normal. And this is a country where I'm bringing up, bringing up my children for a few years, who are also trained at school, about the possibility of a government coming in and shooting them all. And they have to process that. And not just train for that and process it, but also accept that as normal. That's a normal part of life. And thinking, what is that doing to all these children, but also what's it doing to my children? People are professional. They deal with horrific events constantly. But it was one of those where 20 very young school children were murdered. So if you've got children of that age, you can imagine how, how difficult that, that would have been actually to report on the events. The families of the dead now face the ordeal of their funerals, some of them starting here as early as tomorrow. I think as a journalist, you're presented all the time with terrible situations that make no sense you have to develop a kind of professional detachment so you can carry on doing a job reporting on it. For me, Sandy Hook was the biggest challenge to that. It was the hardest job, keeping your detachment. And I think what always strikes you as a parent is when you get reminded of your own children. What really hits home when you're covering the news is when someone is affected who reminds you of you and you think your children aren't that different in age and these were 20 kids aged six and seven. You do almost have to shut it off because that's just one way of dealing with it. You can talk to your friends about some stuff, but you almost take a step back. If you're too involved in what's going on, you, you become emotionally involved. If there's even one step we can take to save another child, 
then surely we have an obligation to try. There were growing calls for changes, for gun control, for things to happen. Are we really prepared to say that we're powerless in the face of such carnage? That's what make it, makes it even more depressing. It didn't actually lead to any change. It is a very different country. It's a very different attitude to guns for historical reasons, for cultural reasons. It's enshrined in the Constitution. One American said to me, you know, the chance to drive a car is a privilege. The chance to buy and own a gun is a God-given right. No man can take that away. And that gives you a very strong sense of how embedded it is in their Constitution, but their culture and their history. If you own a gun, you're not going to give it up easily. You know, there was talk of legislating bullets. You know, keep your guns, but actually you've got to register bullets, and that might actually have an effect, but it's a political minefield. We interviewed a 17-year-old teenager, and just a few days after so many children had been gunned down, he was absolutely insistent there should be no change to gun laws in America. It's the Second Amendment in the Constitution. You can't just change that. I mean, it's a right we all have, and we deserve to have it. We need guns because there's a possibility of tyranny returning. There's a possibility of the British coming back. So they're brought up with this historic sense that they have to be able to have guns for their own good, for their own protection. Frankly, if 20 school children and their teachers being murdered doesn't make you want to change the gun laws, then nothing will. The, the constitutional right to own a gun is sacrosanct and nothing, nothing really will change that. Throughout the aftermath of Sandy Hook, there was these feelings amongst all of us, a hope that it could lead to a change, so these insane situations don't happen again. But also a kind of gnawing sense of dread, which was that if that didn't lead to anything, you'd end up in an even worse situation. That if the killing of 20 children aged six and seven didn't lead to change, then America probably would give up hope. I don't think that's happened yet, but I think um, there is still a sense that if that didn't change it, nothing will.